We're going to have Mike come on up. Man, we have a good crowd today. Um, I'll tell you what, like I did not expect so many in the house considering we have so many ladies up on the hill. Um, that's always good news. Um, and again, men, this is the last week you can sign up. This is it. We want you guys present. Um, we want you guys to press in. And I do think that we're on the precipice of something pretty amazing as a church, but it takes us showing up and takes us actually pressing in. So uh, that being said, gentlemen, um, don't just push it off and say, oh, maybe next year, um, or, oh, I did that last year. No, like, press in. Let's, let's do this together. Amen? Yeah, I got one amen right there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Hey, let's pray. Lord, thank you um, just for, for who you are, what you do in our lives, and um, that you call us to a place um, of better. God, it is better to be um, even a doorkeep in, in your house Lord, but um, I'd, I'd know, there's no place I'd rather be. Um, but God, we all came into this room, God, with um, what needs to be done, what's um, expected, what's, um, God, even things that we have to accomplish after this or what's, uh, yeah, what happened last week. But God, I pray that um, for every heart that cries out, better is one day in, in your presence, not, not just in church, not just in, um, in going religious and, and going through the motions, but better is one moment where I spend before the living God, where he hears my heart cry and I can um, hear how much he loves me and hear how much he responds to my need and is present with me in my struggles and in my pains. And so, Lord, um, I pray that you would, um, you would gift those who came to this place wanting to hear from your word, God wanting to meet with you uh, with a sense of your presence and with a sense of um, calling into what prayer is. In Jesus' name, amen. So this message is, is titled, um, Hungry and Babbling. I don't know if you've ever gotten to the point where I, you're so hungry you can't get a word in edgewise. Like you just can't bleh, bleh. Uh, Anybody that's in that place where you just get hangry um, and you're tired on top of that. And then the waiter comes and you just can't get it out. You can't even spit out what you want to drink. Um, I don't know. I love, I love Arnold Palmer's, but I can't. It's, it's just lemonade and iced tea, but it can't actually get out of my mouth, especially if I'm hungry, without sounding like I've had a Long Island iced tea, because it just sounds like Arnold Palmer, and, I, and my tongue gets fat, and I can't get it out. When you're hungry and babbling, if anybody in here has been in an argument when you were hungry, um, it, it calls to the idea that I have a deep need in me, and I need to respond to it, and I need that need met. Um, and then babbling oftentimes is that I'm just trying to articulate. I'm just trying to get words out edgewise. Uh, any man that is in the room knows that we run out of words. I will run out of words for today. Um, I, will, I will expend all of them um, before noon, and it will turn to grunts. Um, I know my wife can agree to that. She's over there. She was totally nodding her head. I, it will turn to grunts because I've, I've filled my quota of words for the day. When we're looking at um, the Lord's Prayer, um, we are looking at what is it to articulate, what is it for my heart to come before the living God and say, our Father who art in heaven. What is it to actually get those words out? And it's because I'm so hungry and I'm so desperate that I need him to meet with me. And even I sound like I'm babbling, I'm just kind of like falling over my words. He says, when you pray, this is how you pray. And so as we get into this portion of the Sermon on the Mount, there's been some stirring up about what this text is because we've submitted ourselves underneath the teaching of Jesus. And so guess what happens? Uh, it gets a little messy. I talk about, hey, forgiving one another, and it's been a bit crazy this week. Uh, we talk about turning the other cheek. It gets a little bit, you know, interesting. Uh, it's like when you're in your own home and you say, hey, you guys, let's try to be patient this week. Have you ever gone on a road trip with your kids and you're like, hey, let's just be patient. Let's like be kind to each other and it ends up being a nightmare. Um, because whenever you start to call out what the standard is, you're aware of where you fall short of the standard. But the Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus is calling you. He's teaching you how he's going to make you to be. And so when it comes to prayer, um, man, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like being able to, to articulate, to share, to actually lean in and say, this is how I pray. Um, my prayers have looked different throughout the ages. Um, I know that I was praying at a very young age. Uh, if you've ever been in a large concert and there's this cry out from like, and we're talking about with from that teen angst where you're like crying out for something. Anybody ever been in a concert? You guys boring? Come on. You guys have been in shows, right? And then and like, it's just like, it's dark and there's lights and, it's, and you're just like crying out. And that is a prayer. I promise you. 
that, pro, that, that, that kind of almost even like deep, I wouldn't say primal, but that deep call out. They don't know they're praying to something, um, but anytime there's been an anthem that has resonated with a generation, it is a prayer. They're just not praying maybe to God. There's a, there's a call out from the depth of us. I need something. I'm after this. And so there's moments where it's like, man, I've got to get real in my prayers. So Jesus comes along and he says, when you pray, this is how you pray. When you pray, this is how you pray. And so from Hungary and babbling, we go into Matthew 6. Okay? When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. Let's stop there. I've, been, I've even heard people say, you shouldn't pray publicly because look at that verse. You're not supposed to be regarded or rewarded. But this is the idea of repetitive, like religious talk. And it's to actually, it's not to appeal or, um, or even appease or even like honor God. It's to gain the approval of men. You've had these moments where you've pressed into, um, uh, well, you've not pressed in. You're just into a meal. You're at a table and you want somebody to pray for the food. And yet they, they develop this high and lofty prayer. <laughs> Can any of, the, any of the kids relate to this? It's like, you're just like, I just want to eat now. And it becomes this high and lofty prayer and it's drawn out and it gets longer and longer. And then what's difficult is when that prayer doesn't actually align with that person. That person's prayers, they seem high and lofty and they seem rich, but they don't actually reflect the fact they were cussing me out a few minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> And maybe it doesn't have to be that extreme, but it's just like what matches in our private lives becomes public. It becomes on display. Now, I'm in a, in a role where most of my private life is on a weekly basis presented publicly. I cannot tell you the, the, the weight and the pressure, but I will tell you that what's awesome is that it actually keeps me um, honest in my private life <laughs> because it keeps me to that point of I can't actually stand up here and be somebody I'm not. Um, I think God gifted me with that. Even when I was out doing crazy, I was trying to think that everybody, like I was fooling everybody, but everybody actually already knew. Um, it's like living in a fishbowl. It's being on present, like almost trying to present in a certain way, but then being reminded, no, this is who I really am, and I want that to be heard today. That, prior, that our prayer lives can be really messy. Um, they, can, they, cannot be, um, they cannot get to the same results that maybe we wanted. Um, I prayed for lots of things in my life and a lot of unanswered prayers. Jesus himself, um, if you believe this or not, Jesus had an unanswered prayer. Well, how can that be? He's the son of God. You're telling me that there was a prayer that Jesus prayed that was not answered? He had an audience with the Father. He is fully God and fully man. And, it, and you have this moment in the Garden of Gethsemane. There's a garden motif. Starts in the beginning and we fail. And, and that moment of of, it's revealing and it's raw, but it's the idea that we would all fail. And yet here he is in the Garden of Gethsemane and in his humanity, being fully man, cries, cries out, would you let this cup pass from me? Was that prayer answered? No, but he succeeds and is perfect where we are imperfect. And he actually says, not my will, but your will. And his unanswered prayer doesn't then become a reason to blame God or to question God's character and say, did God really say? No, not my will, but your will be done. So Jesus leans into this moment and God answers the prayer in a way that, man, we wouldn't want it answered. We have so many prayers that we pray that if God answered them all, um, <laughs> would it not be a little bit messy? It'd be a little bit messy. So it's not about being um, public with our prayers and looking for esteem and repeating ourselves over and over again so that maybe God will listen. He says, but when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. When your father who sees everything, then your father who sees everything will reward you. There's a secret place, a place of intimacy and relationship where all of the victory you need for the day comes. And I, I will be honest to confess that there are mornings where you go, you launch into, I'm going to pray, and then you just don't because you thought it was prayer. And there are times where people even start to get loud in prayer. I've been in a lot of even, and I've got nothing wrong to say about it, because when I go into a 5.30 um, a.m. prayer meeting, I don't want to hear nice little quiet prayers. Get me with some Pentecostals. Uh, <laughs> you know, but then there's even the text about that. It's the idea of, hey, you don't need to shout. You don't need to lift your voice. 
Little did we know that they were just trying to keep themselves awake <laughs> in a prayer time. But when you pray, don't babble on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. And so we babble on and over and over and over again, and we keep repeating the same thing. And we're guilty of, of doing this with even the Lord's Prayer, that we start to go into this rote repetition of our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We really like the you know, daily bread, but then we kind of, kind of like actually start mumbling when we start saying, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who do against us. We go into this rote repetition we go into this moment where we say, if I do this thing, God will approve. And what he wants is relationship. What he wants is, is even, to, dare I say, intimacy. He wants a secret place. And so referring not just to long-winded, pious prayers, the ones that sound really good. No, you can tell a lot about a man by the way he prays. And C.S. Lewis even presses to say, look, you, man, you should be praying, let it be the real me praying to the real you. Let it be me. That's one of our core values here is, man, we're not trying to put on a show. We're not trying to be disingenuous, unauthentic. We are who we are. And if my prayer right now sounds like, God, help me. I don't have it. I don't have it together. Then we let that out. You, we try to make prayer really nice and neat and packaged because, one, we've never read the laments of Psalms, and we've never looked at the imprecatory Psalms that say, God, why do the wicked prosper? Why are we here? What is going on? And having that type of freedom to be able to ask our God, God, would you relate to me like a father who explains himself to me, who, who shares his heart with me to say, this is why you feel the way you do. So there's a secret place and there's reward in that place. And we're not focused on the vanity. We're not focused on these ideas of repetitious um, prayers because I can't gain any favor or merit simply through superstition. And I hate that because I wish I could just like grab a pinch of salt and be like, okay, I'm good. No, but God wants more than superstition. He wants more than formula in your life. He wants relationship. Now, if you've had any kind of relationship with prayer, um, it's kind of a, a love-hate relationship. Can I get a, a, a nod? <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with prayer. But Jesus says, as you pray, this is how you should pray. As you pray, this is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, you can say it with me, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debted against. Okay. Go ahead. Evil. And the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Not a lot of confidence towards the end there. I pulled back so I could hear your voices, right? There's, there's so much in the text, and the way it starts is our Father. I love the heartbeat that says the, the, the intimate, close relationship, my Jesus, even Ann Wilson's song. Let me tell you about my Jesus. But it's our Father. There's a uniting in that. There's a, this is our Father. This is who he is. And in that first statement, it is relational, I want you to know that it'd be super weird if I made my kids call me pastor. <laughs> to start with title, like every time they address me, pastor. <laughs> I don't even, I'll be honest, I don't even like it very much when you guys do it. It's okay, but it's awesome. Just call me Mike. Because there's a relationship. Before there's anything we do for each other, there's relationship. And so this whole idea of like, we start not with almighty, no, our father, and he brings it relational all the attributes, all that is applied to who God is in his character, right, almighty or whatever, you know, characteristic we draw from the Old Testament or new, but the first statement is our Father. There's a big shift that happens, there's this moment where you go from that's the church to that's our church or that's my church. There's a big difference between God and our Father, but he says, don't just let that be buddy Jesus. Don't let that make into something where you start to go into, um, you know, Jesus is my homeboy, and you get too comfortable because he immediately goes, hallowed be your name. Holy, holy, reverence, awe, struck wonder, this amazing God who created everything and yet gives me an audience with him. 
You know that God would allow you to talk to him? <laughs> Let alone, like, allow. Now he even goes one step further to say, I want to hear from you. And this is the type of relationship that I want. Understanding that it's being with my father, being with my dad. It's not title. You know, the agnostic prays a different way. They pray to whom it may concern. Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> to whom it may concern. And like I said before, our, our, our culture actually needs some public prayers because they're all praying publicly. It's just what are they praying to? Make no mistake, many protests are prayers. It's just how is it voiced and what is it? When, when you hear somebody crying out for a certain thing, even if it's evil, there, there's, a, there's a deep longing in their heart. What are they praying to? And so I go from that point of like, okay, there's holiness that balances this relationship out. And I go from intimacy with my dad to there is a holy father. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sounds like a great, great idea, but I'm not seeing a lot in alignment right now. Even within, you know, the study in the Sermon on the Mount, it's stirring up things in people. <laughs> and it's, it's drawing into attention and drawing up our memories to go, wait, actually, Jesus said to live like this. If you haven't seen some of the tension in our community, um, you probably kept your eyes kind of tight or you're just not aware. But it's like when you start talking about living with love towards one another, all of a sudden you find yourself in situations where you're like, I don't really want to love that person. You find yourself in those situations where I don't really want to be patient. I don't actually want to love my enemy. And these things develop. So thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Just today. He'll go on in the Sermon on the Mount to say, hey, it's just for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just today. Do you have what you need? And then we like the idea of forgive us our debts, but why are you tying into this relationship now? For, let me forgive those who have committed debts against me. Why are you drawing up forgiveness? Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Uh, C.S. Lewis, he go, gets in on this text where he says, Look, this Greek word for lead us not to temptation is the idea of not being set into trial or trying circumstances. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be led into hard testing. But oftentimes, when I pray for courage, God leads me into hard testing. Oftentimes, when I pray for patience, God leads me into hard testing. Oftentimes, when I'm crying out, God, I want to see revival in my area, he leads me into hard testing. And we come to this point where we say, God, lead me not to temptation, but if, you're, if, if, if this is your will, I'm not going to fight you on it. And I don't allow it then to become something that becomes a, a struggle between thy and my. My will be done? No, 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 no. Thy will be done. So though it's going to sound absolutely schizophrenic for anybody on listening to the podcast because they won't actually have a visual, I want to actually talk to you guys about something that was written as a dialogue in the Lord's Prayer. Because the, dial the, the, the Lord's Prayer is not meant to be a monologue. Let's just go through it rotely and move in. Instead, it's actually it's a moment of let's start a conversation. But we don't like prayer like that. We don't want to actually hear from God. It's, it's, the, it's the approach that the people gave to Moses. You go talk to him. Because here's the thing, if somebody else talks on behalf of God, I can argue with him, but if God speaks for himself, where do I go? And so there's this great writing where a, a man begins to pray. He just says, our Father who art in heaven. Yes? Uh, don't interrupt me, I'm praying. But you called me here. Called you? I didn't call you. I'm praying, our, our Father, which art in heaven. There, you did it again. Seriously, anybody listening to this is going to think I'm nuts. <laughs> what did I do? You called me. Our Father, which art in heaven, here I am. What is on your mind? On my mind? I mean, I didn't mean anything by it. I was, you know, just saying a few things, saying prayers for my day. It makes me feel better. I have a devotional life. This is like, this is what you do. It makes me feel good, kind, you know. Hold on. What do you mean by all that? Well, I just mean, you know, it's devotion. This is what you do. You go through the Lord's Prayer. Okay, carry on. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Do you even know what that means? 
hollowed? Yeah, I mean, you're God. Why don't you tell me? It's just like, you know, it's like, you know, other, something, you know? It's like holy, holy, holy. It means there's reverence in this conversation. It means there's reverence in this conversation. I've been set apart for the one and most important relationship in your life. Okay. I didn't know it really meant that. Okay. Okay, well, um, okay, honored. Okay, holy. Okay. Um, okay, so I, can, I, can I keep on? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Makes... <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Okay, hollow be your name. Never didn't know that. Okay, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Stop. Do you mean that? Do you really mean that? Do you really mean my will be done? Well, yeah, you know, I mean, I think it would be really great if you were in control of all things and, like, your will, you know, on earth as it is in heaven. And, you know, I've heard that, like, you guys have gold as pavement up there, so that would be really sweet down here. And, it, you know, there's some people, there's a lot of bad people out there that are always against me. Can you just please step in and be in control? Am I in control of you? Do you really want my will to be done? Well, I guess, yeah, sure, why not? What are you doing about it? Well, doing nothing, I guess. I'm just, you know, I think I'm kind of, it'd be neat if you, if you ruled down here. But do I have control of you? Well, I go to church. I'm praying the Lord's Prayer. That's not what I asked. I love this writer, presses in, he says, look, God says, praying is dangerous. Praying can change you. You can wind up change, you know. And that's just it. I'm trying to get across to you something in regards to the Lord's Prayer and all prayer is it actually does shape us and it does change us. It's not too late to stop believing. And I would rather, I'd rather actually have you press in and say, I'm not going to stop believing in prayer. We think that we come to a certain point of religion. We, we've prayed all, all the prayers and then all of a sudden, wait, it's not too late. I I've have, might have tradition. I might have years of following God. But it's never too late to stop believing. That's unfortunately what people see. They see that, you know, after all the years, you should have monumental faith. But after all these years, I've just stopped believing. But prayer changes things. Prayer changes me. Prayer changes the world around me. And I'm not going to stop praying that you press in and say, you know what? This prayer changes lives. It's not just rote. It's not religious. It's not like just going through the motions. It's relationship that is being built. Prayer is a dangerous thing. I'm going to repeat this twice because it's so gold. Oswald Chambers saying, prayer is getting into perfect communion with God. There's no place I'd rather be than in this moment. And I tell him what I know he knows. I tell him what he already knows, but I do so that I might get to know it as he does. I'll read it one more time. I tell him what, he, what I know he knows. I know it seems like, well, why would God want that? So that I may get to know it as he does. God already knows, but I need to get to know it as he does. I need to be able to approach it as he does. And there are times where you've prayed for certain things, prayer changes things, and I, I get into this exchange, this power exchange of not my will, but your will, and, and actually, let me tell you how this should go, and if it doesn't go this way, I'm actually going to do the thing that is human. I'm going to let it challenge my belief about your character, and now I'm just going to go ahead and change my theology to stop praying for the thing that might be difficult to believe in. So you pray, you know, at a time, you, you hear somebody come up, and they, they ask for prayer. They say, hey, I need prayer for my hearing, and you're like, okay, great. And you lay your hands, you know, on the person on their shoulder and say, okay, I'm believing God can heal you and, and bring you, you know, total restoration. And, and you're believing God and you're like fervent, right? You're like, you know, sweating it. And I've been in these situations in Thailand. I, I prayed for a guy with a withered hand, right? And I'm like, this is the moment. I've been reading Acts for the very first time. This is when God heals, you know? And I'm like trying to stretch out his hand and it's not working, um, and there's, no, there's like a language barrier, so it's super, thank you, Mark. Because it it's comical at times. You're like, God has called you to pray for things, and then it doesn't happen. You're like, am I on display? Am I a fool here? You know, like, what, what do you need from me? What do you want from me? And so someone comes up, and they ask 
God, would you, you know, would you heal me? Um, and so this, this man who came forward to ask for prayer for a, hear, a hearing, I said, okay. And I lay my hand, I start praying for him. Would you please heal this man? Would you please heal him? And finally, I look at him after I say amen. I said, like, well, how's your hearing now? He's like, I don't know. It's not until Tuesday. <laughs> uh, it was in my delivery. It was in my delivery. I'm sorry. I drew it out too long. Um, there's moments where you do, and on a serious note, you pray for things to change. Louis Giglio is actually currently um, teaching through a study on prayer, and so it's nice when you hear other voices that are speaking on the same text, and they're talking about the same thing. And he, he mentioned that prayer is exchange. It's not what I want to do, but it's what you want to do. And that's the greatest exchange. That's the difficult moment where you say, it's not my will, but your, thy will. There's an exchange in prayer of not my will, but thy will be done. And so there's moments, you know, Matthew um, talks about that, that trial moment. Um, Eleven years ago, in October, um, this shining example of what you want in student ministry, although very messy at times, was this young man who um, I came to know pretty well. He had a, a crazy hair, sh- you know, shiny gold. We, we, we regarded it like a, a, a lion's mane. And we, we were so thrilled to have this young man, um, one, give his heart to the Lord, but also that he was, um, like I said, it was a little messy at time. He, there were constantly ladies that were talking to me about how he'd broken their hearts. So it was a little bit messy, but we were grateful that he was going after Bible study. He's going after the character of God. He's going after these things. Well, one night after he had um, taken a, uh, he and a friend had taken a young lady back home after youth group, um, he lost the back end of his truck because it, it's lighter back there and, and you slide sideways sometimes when the roads are wet. And uh, if you've ever seen what an oak tree can do to someone um, or even to a vehicle, um, Dalton was placed um, in ICU. You travel down to Fresno, you get to the ICU, which is the worst part of any of it, and you know the families have been separated because... One was driving and the other was not. But though it was an accident, the, the, the anger is going to, to come up. Of, of this happened to my boy, you know, this, this is what came, right? And so I sat with the family and I sat with the other family and, you know, find out, okay, one, one kid's okay. He's going to make it. He's got a bu- couple of busted ribs, but he's okay. And then Dalton, for six months, we spend fighting for him to be healed. A youth group full of kids, like saying, hey, we'll believe Right, we're going to believe, and every time they would struggle, they would be- we would believe. We'd throw these concerts so you can recognize the room. 200 people coming and, and praying that his traumatic brain injury would heal, and even seeing results. Like, we saw him start to talk, and we're like, this is going to, this is going to be it. And I'm telling God how it's going to be, because guess what? My ideas are so much better than his. If this young man gets healed, right, revival's going to break out. All these kids are going to say, that, oh my gosh, look what God can do in prayer. And they're going to move out into their campus. And they're going to start, like their faith is going to be solidified. And you can see from the next photo, it's not what happened. And there's those moments where you go, okay, God, you asked me to do this. And I put myself out there and I acted a fool and I stood there and proclaimed in faith that God can heal, and then he did not. Well, I could just change my theology now. I could just sidestep and say, you know what? Um, well, yeah, I'll pray. God, if you're going to heal, if it's according to your will, and I get really shy about it. Or I, I trust that even unanswered prayer is not going to challenge the way that I see who God is. And I'll never forget the moment where the struggle of not my will, but your will came. Uh, actually, Casey Butterfield, you should come tonight. He's, he's a great preacher. He and I traveled, and we actually prayed over Dalton before he passed. And there was an awareness of not our will, but your will be done, God. And not this earth, but where he's heading for heaven and, and pure healing and total restoration. But Jesus does something. In the Garden of Gethsemane, I want you to note, it says, going a little farther. He doesn't stop. He goes a little farther. And maybe your secret place, this time of, you know, looking for a reward from God has all been about, hey, what he does externally. The reward that is given isn't always given publicly. The reward is in you, a person of faith and a person of, man, I'm going to pray no matter what I see in this world because I believe prayer can change things. 
And I'm not going to become unsettled when I don't get the answered prayer I want. So Jesus, going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Not my will, but your will. I exchange my for thy. And I say, God, you, you are in control. And I'm not going to stop praying in accordance with your, your perfect will. And when I see your permissible will, when I see the things that are sometimes allowed because you have the great picture, I don't let it challenge the character of your goodness. I don't let it challenge how I see you as you really are. There are moments where um, it gets really difficult because we like to add something to the, our, our Lord's prayers, right? And we just, instead of lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, we add this one line, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. But Jesus adds to the end of that prayer, not just amen, be done. He adds, if you're going to receive forgiveness, I need you to be forgiving. I will tell you, I will never forget the moment where I let go of this idea that God took Dalton. Where I, dare I say, forgave God from what I've been holding against him and let it go. And finally, and I know it's a cliche, but literally fall, autumn, all of it, the trees are going to tell you what is so beautiful about letting go right now. Letting go of this idea that, God, you didn't answer the prayer like I wanted you to answer the prayer. And saying, God, I'm not going to let it change how I see your character and see your goodness. And we get to this point where we say, God, I actually let go. There are people out there that have this idea, um, Nietzsche being one, that Christianity makes a thousand promises and keeps none. I want to be a, a believer in such, to such a degree that my life looks like somebody who never gave up belief. Matthew 16, uh, 616 goes into it a little bit harder. It says, okay, now that you've got prayer down, now that you figured that out, let me push you a little bit farther when you fast. And, I, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not just trying to like drill it into you guys, but sometimes you need to pray in such a way that your tears are saying what your, your words cannot any longer. That there was moments where the disciples went out and they went to cast out demons. They wanted to see deliverance. They wanted to see change in people's lives. And they come back feeling unable to affect what they wanted to see. And Jesus says, this type comes out only by prayer and fasting. I don't know how many in this room have given up on praying what we've been praying for the past two, two or so years. Praying revival in the area. Praying that we would see our country turn around. Have we given up the belief that God can do simply because we haven't seen the results that we've wanted to see? Or breakthrough in your family where you're seeing relationship and, and wholeness in life. Did you give up on praying those things? Have you given up on the idea that, God, you didn't answer the prayers the way I wanted you to answer the prayers, and so now I'm not going to pray the same way anymore? Because I can tell you, when you've seen healing, when you've seen deliverance, when you've seen people change because of prayer, all of a sudden you're like, you know what? It's worth it. I'm not giving up. And there's a secret place there. So you don't get all gloomy like the hypocrites do. You don't show everybody that you're fasting. That's the worst part. If, you, if you've been around people that they can't eat something and they want to tell you about it, right? I mean, especially like if there's something they, they're allergic to, you're sitting there enjoying it and they're telling you they can't enjoy it and you're making, they're taking your enjoyment. Um, it, it's, it, fasting is not meant to be like that. It's not meant to be like somebody who shows up and says, oh, that looks really good, but I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> Moment of silence for those lactose intolerant. Oh, that bread looks so good, but I can't eat gluten. <laughs> now, you genuinely have that. I'm like making fun of you, um, though I'm excited that I don't have that same malady. Um, but there's this moment where you're like, you don't need to tell me. Or people who are into, like intermittent fasting, and they want to tell you about it, you know, and you're just sitting there enjoying a donut. Well, that's good for you. The, <laughs> fasting is meant to be private because God is going to reward that commitment. And you're not on a hunger strike. You're not Gandhi trying to convince the Almighty that, you know, it's a hunger strike against the will of God. That's not fasting. Fasting is where I put myself before the living God and say, I haven't seen the results I've wanted to see in prayer and I'm not giving up. I'm not going to stop asking and seeking and knocking. Uh, you know, some people whose prayers for 20 years have been the same. 
some parents who have prayed for prodigals to return, some people who have actually been on their faces saying, God, bring the revival like I saw in the Jesus movement. Those people who are praying for societies, praying for you know, p- friend groups. I have an entire list on a coffee cup of all the people I graduated with. And if I ever use that coffee cup, I always pray for certain names. Because I'm not going to stop praying that I see the results of, of, honestly, that salvation is for more than just me. So I want to encourage you guys um, that in your fasting you pray. Because you don't pray while you're fasting, it's just a really unhealthy diet that you actually get before God and say, you know what, I want to exchange my will for thy will. There's folks in our fellowship with cancer. There's folks that are are believing in God for healing. And we're going to continue to believe in God for healing. Marriages that want to, that honestly, some people have chalked up and said that there's no way that'll continue. There's no way that 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 relationship's going to work. Saying no, we're going to believe in God for that marriage to be beautiful, for that relationship to be restored. And we're going to continue believing and hoping because it's worth it. It's so worth it that sometimes you need you to pray so hard that your tears say what your words cannot, that your laughter begins to say what your words cannot, that you actually pray, even if you look like a madman or a madwoman, a little crazy to say, you know what? I'm believing in God for this. And if I, if I see the results are different than what I expected, that I don't then let it shake me about the core belief I have in who God is. I don't know what you guys are contending with, you know, contending for, but I'm gonna invite the team up because, and some of us just need to exchange my will for thy will. And for some of us, we also need to be in that place of, God, I forgive you for not answering the prayer the way that I thought you would. God's, I know that seems so bizarre, like we gotta forgive God for anything. You don't but your heart needs it to stop blaming him, to stop saying it's the woman that you gave me, it, it, to stop saying, making these statements that it's your fault, that you led me into temptation, that I did these things. You're instead saying, no, God, I didn't get the result that I wanted, but I still believe in you. I still trust you, that I'm still gonna believe and, and, and hold on to that faith in who you are. Um, so Brandon will come up, let's just pray. Lord, thank you for... Uh, at times, unanswered prayers. At times, um, a shift and a change in us, an exchange where instead of my will, it was your will. God, for those in this room that have been um, contending and fighting and believing you for the results, God, and you haven't shown up in the way that they expected yet, I pray that you would give them patience, that those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. God, we bring our wants and our needs to you, but we, we start by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, that your name is holy, and that we want to see, Lord, we want to see your will here on earth. So change us. Lord, help us to be content with the day-to-day. Help us to also, God, press in to seek your forgiveness and to forgive others. And we pray, ultimately, Lord, you wouldn't send us into a time of hard testing, but if you do, if you so will to send us into the wilderness, Lord, that we would not, we would not deny who you really are. We love you, God, and we ask for faith to rise in this place and that we wouldn't give up in believing in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so if I can have the prayer team, anybody wants to contend with somebody for something, um, I'll get the prayer team up here. Um, if you want to just, man, this is the thing I got to bring before the Lord, um, but not to be passive about it. So I'm going to ask you guys all to stand. Um, if, you, if you need to depart, you can depart. God bless you. But if you want to like contend for something, and you're like, man, this is the thing I've been praying for, but I'm praying alone, um, that you would actually move forward. Um, ask somebody to pray with you so that God would show up in your